So I'm trying to find the current voice. Let's have a look. Hello everyone, Florian here and welcome to another episode of Heiser Says. Grab your stein of coffee because, well, I want to take you on a little journey where I'm trying to find out about the current voice to parliament for all of the indigenous Australians that we have in this fantastic country of ours. Now, for those of you that, that aren't aware, there is a huge debate, well, a huge, well, media portrayal of a uh, impending referendum, you know, a grassroots referendum, apparently, about a voice, Australians to vote for a First Nations voice to Parliament. Uh, you know, early August, apparently. And what is it? What is the Indigenous voice to Parliament, and how will it work? The Guardian's writing about it, so the media is all full about, full of it. People are talking about it. Everyone's pretty much painting it in such a way that this is a given. Now, I am really concerned that a lot of Australians will just simply vote for that because, you know, they want to uh, be on the right side of history and they won't think about this at all. Honestly, at all. I can see that happening and that's very dangerous. Now, Indigenous Australians already have a voice to Parliament. We all have a voice to Parliament in Australia. They're our House of Representative members. Now, I can completely appreciate the fact why Indigenous Australians feel completely let down by their current representatives, because we all are, pretty much. We all feel like they don't give a crap about us, uh, particularly if you're in the wrong demographic or if you live in a remote area. Now, I wanted to find out, I wanted to find out who these people were, who the current House of Reps members were that have the biggest Indigenous populations in Australia, in their constituents, in their electorates because they would be the voice of those people to Parliament. They should be the one raising issues from those communities to our Parliament because there's a lot of issues in remote communities and a lot of Indigenous communities around Australia, and it was really quite sad. And we'll, to be quite honest, the cynical bastard I am, I think we'll be having these same discussions in another decade's time because nothing, nothing ever changes. They just piss money away at initiatives and programs without addressing the fundamental issues. Now, search trends have been pretty flat recently for The Voice, but they went up in May and the beginning of the year, you know, pretty high throughout the whole country. Now, in my journey, I, I thought, okay, I, I should be able to get the information, you know, all the electorates for the House of Reps around Australia, and then we can simply break, get the uh, racial demographic for the constituents of those electorates. Because, I mean, if, if we're going to have a voice that's only targeting one demographic of Australia, we should have that data, shouldn't we, to see which politicians or which House of Rep members are failing these people. So, I can't find it. It doesn't exist. The AEC doesn't have that data. They've got it by um, division by age, group and gender that's pretty much all the data you can get and i reached out to them and asked them you know i'm trying to find data for indigenous populations per electorate do you have anything at that granular level and their response via twitter was a message unfortunately our data isn't that granular it goes to state territory level only that is in part because our indigenous enrollment rate is an estimate based on a mix of abs and centrelink data as we do not ask people to declare whether they are indigenous when they enroll. Okay, so they're not capturing that data, which, I mean, you think they should, shouldn't they? If, if they want to encourage at least enrollment of Indigenous Australians to get them to voting, because their estimates show that their vote, their participation rate in a democracy is lower than normal. Shouldn't that be something they're targeting rather than a voice? If people aren't even partaking in the democratic system that we have now because they're so disenfranchised. Do you think this is going to make any difference? So the AEC couldn't help me. They didn't have the data. They didn't have the data, which is a good or a bad thing. Now, how many people are we talking about here? Out of a population of 25 million, we've got about, hang on, I need to see here, about 942,000 people that are Indigenous. And you can see you've got 333 in New South Wales, only 78 in Victoria. 78 in Victoria. So should a Victorian who's voting on this, the 6.4 million non-Indigenous, should they have as much a say as a New South Welshman or a Queenslander? 
When there are 273,000 queen, 73, Queenslanders who are indigenous, only 52,000 in South Australia, which is surprising when you consider how much land is under indigenous control. Western Australia, 120,000. Tasmania, 33,000. Northern Territory is... Hang on, I can't see that here. Let me make that a bit bigger. Is uh, 76,000. And the ACT is 9,500. So that, that's the population that we're talking about here. There are other demographics which have a larger share of the Australian population. But there's no discussion of giving those groups a voice. And there really shouldn't be because we all have a voice to Parliament through our House of Reps. And rather than building a new infrastructure to try and deal with these issues in these remote communities, maybe we should be listening to the Indigenous politicians that are raising issues in Parliament that are completely ignored. The fact that you've got, you've got Indigenous women walking to Canberra and the only politician that'll talk to them is Pauline Hanson. Funny that, isn't it? So, now, I'm trying to find some data where Indigenous Australians live. And uh, we've got this here, the Remote Indigenous, Indigenous Procurement Policy Map. If we jump over to here, we can see... So the Indigenous Procurement Policy, uh, the electronic remote Indigenous procurement map allows users to search Australia by location to determine remote or non-remote IPP status. The RIPP map is based on the Australian Bureau of Statistics 2011 census data using Indigenous areas. Please note that the electronic map should be used to determine. Now this is about, um, I'm assuming it's to do with procurement and buying things and projects and stuff like that, you know. Let, let's have a look at this map because is this something that I could use with the electoral data maybe to kind of get a, a feel for for where these populations are? At least to, to identify some towns or places where people are living and we can have a look here. If we have a look, what do we have here? What is it? So there you go, you've got remote park. West Ball One, um, Marianne, Marani, and uh, I mean, there you go, John. Oh, I mean, John Holland. So we've got all these areas, guys, around all of Australia. And it, I mean, this seems to make sense where you have significant indigenous populations living, at least in some of the projects we've worked on. I mean, here you go. What is that Groot Island? have the name on here does it yeah um Groot Island there you go so I can get this data this is available and I'm thinking I can use this data with the electoral data to then find out who the members of the House of Representatives are who are letting down their people okay um there you go if you have a look at this we've got this is the federal election winning party, 2022, 21st of May, 2022. So look, you've got a whole lot of red there. You've got a whole lot of blue here. Got a bit of blue up here. A lot of red here. You know, a lot of nationals here. So this it's not just one party or the other that's let down these people. So how the hell is a voice going to make any difference? Just putting that there. So this is one suggestion I'm trying to do to find out who these people are, who the House of Representative people are. Because on, honestly, someone living in a remote community here or out here is going to have a very different life to an Indigenous person living in Sydney, Melbourne, or Brisbane. Okay, and we, we can... It's the it's, it's same with all Australians, regardless of race, if you're living in the middle, middle of nowhere, guys. So another thing... Let me know your thoughts on this one, okay? If you, if you have any other suggestions, let me know because I'm going to have to take this into QGIS and merge the data to try and get something out of it here. We'll, we'll see. Because, I mean, the po there's a whole lot of areas here, but the population in APY land in South Australia is hardly anything. It's nothing. So how can they have this many things? I'm, I, mm, I don't know. I guess I'm going to learn about it. Now, does everyone remember ATSIC? I think it's worth talking about it, guys, because this is... Well, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission. And I thought we'll just go through some snippets from Wikipedia to remind everyone, because this isn't the first time we've tried 
to deal with these issues here in Australia. We're trying to, to address the significant gap between Indigenous Australians and the rest of Australia. And I, frankly, I'd say a big portion of it is this difference, where people are living, honestly. But, you know... The Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission from 1990 to 2005 was the Australian government body through which Aboriginal Australians and Torres Strait Islanders were formally involved in the process of government affecting their lives. Doesn't that sound very familiar? It seems very familiar, doesn't it? Established under the Hawke government, a man who could scull a beer in 1990, a number of Indigenous programs and organisations fell under the overall umbrella of ATSIC. It was dismantled in 2004 in the aftermath of corruption allegations and litigation involving its chairperson, Jeff Clark. Now, you need to look up this guy, okay? Because I, I, the stuff that he's been accused of is horrific. It really is. I mean, bloody hell, if they had social media back then. So let, let's have a look at just some of the corruption investigations here because... Guys, this is the problem. If we establish this voice, we can't get rid of the bloody thing. What's going to happen? We already have so many politicians that are just a pain in the ass. In 2001, Atsik became embroiled in controversy over litigation surrounding his chairperson, Jeff Clark, relating to his, alleg uh, to his alleged participation in a number of, you can read that word, I can't on YouTube, in the 70s and 80s, after, be uh, after being named by four women. Atsik was also investigated for corruption and the embezzlement of funds intended for service delivery to help Aboriginal peoples. And that's, that's the, you'll see, that's recent too. I mean, this is the problem. You'll, you'll create all of this infrastructure and the poor people, you know, the poor normal Aussies who happen to be Aboriginal living in these remote parts of Australia are going to get bugger all, you know? Maybe. Here's a suggestion. We take all the money we'd spend on The Voice and we just subsidize healthy food, fresh meat for out here, this part of Australia, right here. That's right here, to, to address the bloody diabetes and health issues that people have. How about, how about that? And, you know, oh, boy. Soon after this, the government under then Prime Minister John Howard began to remove some of ATSIC's financial, fiscal powers, which were then transferred to new independent organizations, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Services. So are they, are they going to disappear now that we've got a proposed voice, these organizations, or not? I mean, we don't know. We're voting in a referendum, and we don't know what the outcome is, what the proposal is. They're going to figure that out later. I really get the feeling Labor just wants to get this over the line so they can claim that they've achieved something. Because the last big referendum we had for gay marriage, that was a liberal victory. You know, they brought that in, not Labor. So the government suspended Jeff Clark as chair of ATSIC in 2003 after he was convicted of obstructing police during a pub prawl. And the uh, Lionel Quartermarine uh, and Lionel Quartermarine became the acting chair. A review of ATSIC was commissioned in 2003. The report authored by J uh, John Hanford, Jackie Huggins and Bob Collins was titled In the Hands of the Regions, a new ATSIC report in the review of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission. And it recommended reforms which gave greater control of ATSIC to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people at the regional level. That, that, I, I, I quite like the sound of that. Because this is the thing, the most important level of government should be the council level honestly it should have much more control so you can shape communities how you want because you can actually get out of communities at that level indigenous affairs minister amanda vanstone stated that the review had concluded that atsic had not connected well with indigenous australians and was not serving them well so let's just remember that and here's one thing i want to finish on a article from last year august 2021, Indigenous leader uh, Jeff Clark to stand trial on 384 fraud-related charges involving $2 million. He's a character, this guy. You go, go through his... Uh, what's... Oh, anyway, look him up on Wikipedia. So, guys, let's have a talk about... This. So, what, what do you think about trying to get... identify the House of Reps members 
Because it's not just the ones that are sitting now. They've, if they're new, they've probably had very little time. It's the ones that have been there for years, for decades. What have they done to help their local communities? And are we really voting for something that will be enshrined in the Constitution that we won't be able to get rid of? Is this just going to be another ATSIC again? Another complete mess, potential for corruption, potential for crime. But reality, I think the most concerning thing is the fact that it won't, it'll be so far removed from the everyday people. Do you think an inner city uh, indigenous Melbourne citizen is going to have the same viewpoint as someone living in the middle of Australia? What, what do you think? Anyway, guys, let me know your thoughts and opinions on this one. And if you have any suggestions where I can get the data that I'm looking for, I would, frankly, I would encourage you to really question and be critical of how you vote in this coming referendum until we know what they're actually going to propose. Because, frankly, I think it'll, it just sounds like more political posturing. But maybe I'm just too cynical, guys, and it'll be fairy floss and perfect. As always, thanks for watching. Check out my other channels, Heiser Bim and Heiser Does, my newly rebranded channel where I just discuss things that I do, completely irrelevant of the news. If you want to support us, you can financially on YouTube or Patreon. You can use our referral links, Amazon, eBay, Independent Reserve, or Aussie Broadband. You can buy our merch or call us if you need an architect. Take care, everyone. Have a great day. And I'll see you all in the next episode of Heiser Says. Bye for now.